I want to start by, um, you heard me talk earlier this morning about what we mean by resilience. And I think it's important to just to make sure that we're grounded in that framing. Uh, before we get started in this exercise and, and really kind of di deep diving deeper into what building community resilience is about. So earlier you heard me talk about resilience and not only from the perspective or strictly from the perspective of how we want to help communities bounce back when we recognize that those conditions that's where, that the adversity derives from is inequitable to begin with. Um, that we actually want to purposefully work across sectors so that we're putting in those supports and buffers so that communities can actually bounce forward and thrive. And so that's why we've started, you know, a picture says is a thousand, worth a thousand words. And so you'll, we're going to work with one of the pictures that we created in BCR that helped to facilitate this conversation. And then we have started implementing or using a very simple graphic there. You see in the, t in the bottom left-hand corner there to reinforce what we know is that relationship between trauma, equity, and resilience. And so um, understanding that the traumas that we, that individuals um, experience are driven largely by inequities in our communities, inequities that are driven by systems, and that if we are going to get to resilience, we have to address equity. So maybe that's not where we started the conversation four years ago, but as people begin to understand adversity and understand trauma, equity is that big elephant. And so we've invited the elephant into the conversation, and we've heard the elephant roar. And so I'm going to invite, we had a little bit of a heated discussion earlier in the earlier session, so I want to remind everyone that this is a safe space. There are no wrong ideas, there are no bad people. Sometimes we have bad experiences, but that we can all respect each other's opinions and share dialogue, because through that dialogue, we actually begin to learn, we can see each other. So I just want to do that level set. Um, so when we talk about building community resilience, what is it? What is the process, that model? And how do we use this in communities to drive towards building more resilience? So uh, we are a national, movement um, that is in five communities, and I'll show you those communities in a minute here, but what is BCR? It's actually pretty simple, four simple components. And we're gonna focus our work today on the shared understanding piece of it, but I wanna give you a broader overview of how all these pieces fit together. And so the creating the shared understanding, when we started this work four years ago, it was really trying to create a shared understanding around adverse childhood experiences. Because ACEs, if you're outside of social work, or perhaps if you were an enlightened pediatrician, you really didn't understand what ACEs were. And you certainly didn't understand what the pair of ACEs are. And so we wanted to help people understand that when we talk about the pair of ACEs, we're not talking about a winning hand, but that we are talking about something that is solvable with determination and through collaboration. And so understanding, as you see that tree on the table there in front of you, what does adversity look like in our community? And what's driving that adversity? And then through that process of working with community members and across systems, you begin to identify, well, what's our state of readiness to respond to these issues that we've identified? I'm gonna suggest that you sit with someone, because we're gonna do some sharing. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, understanding what are our provider capacities, what are the resources that we can bring to bear, because we don't want to just sit in a deficit model. We want to actually build upon so much that's out, actually out there. And through that, you can figure out how to connect with various partners, various systems, because if you identify a gap, more than likely there's somebody out there in the, in the, in the ecosystem that's delivering on that. So that's when you begin to reach out and build your cross-sector partners. So it's not just working with social work and education, but it's also including public health, it's including the business, uh, business development, business community, um, all kinds of unlikely suspects, and we'll go into that a little bit later. And then the community piece of this. So I want you to notice, it might be hard to see here, but I know if you've downloaded the app, you will see that there's in the middle there are these two arrows, and it's really to denote that this is all a continuous improvement. So you're really doing all four of these 
at the same time, which is actually pretty natural. We all do probably in our work, but we don't necessarily look at it discreetly in these four components. Um, but the community engagement piece is something that I think a lot of us do as a check the box, because that's what they tell us we have to do versus a grant or a research project. But how do you authentically engage that and embed the community in your work? And so that's part of what we do with BCR is that we're very deliberate in how communities at the table from the very beginning and through every step of the process with regard to um, identification of the issues and co-creation of the solutions. So that's the process. And the guiding post, the, the North Star of sorts, are those three circles, trauma, equity, and resilience. So really boiling it down to a simple understanding so you don't have to have a PhD to do this work. So one of the things that we all like to do, nobody wants to go it alone. Um, when I first started doing this, I was the lone nut because everyone was telling me it's too big, can you just pick one piece of it? And I said, well, if, if going at one silo or one issue would solve the issue, we would have solved this a long time ago, but that's the problem. We've all been staying in our silos. And so maybe it is being the lone nut and saying, no, we have to embrace the complexity, or as my partners in Cincinnati say, and I guess it's a slogan somewhere, say yes to the mess. So it's messy, it's okay. When you do this with friends, it's okay to be messy <laughs> together. And so that's what we've done. So I've got friends across the country that said, you know, she's not gonna be a lone nut. We're gonna go in and do this together. So what I want you to take away from this map, though, is not about how many nuts there are across the country, um, <laughs> but rather really look closely at where these things are happening and think about the political environments in which these are occurring. We're in southwestern Ohio, southeastern Indiana, northern Kentucky, about as conservative as your state legislature here is in Texas. And yet this work is thriving. We're in Missouri, in Kansas, and in southern Illinois. Again, the work is thriving. Now you would look at the map and say, well, of course, it can work in Oregon. I mean, keep Oregon weird. Isn't that like their slogan? They're proud about that? Well, yeah. Some of the more innovative approaches have been developed in Oregon because it's a little bit more politically friendly. But that doesn't mean that there isn't something that we can learn in Oregon and apply in Texas, which is very much what our partners in Dallas are doing with regard to how do we put trauma-informed practice in schools and work across sectors to create trauma-informed environments for our families. So the work um, expresses itself very differently based on the partners that come to the table, based on what you decide are on the branches and the leaves, and what's in your soil that's feeding the adversity. And so we'll talk about specifically what some of that work looks like across the country, but I want to dive a little bit deeper and help you understand the potential of the power of collaboration. And so in BCR, we have a lot of acronyms, you know, sorry, I'm in DC and that's what we do. But it's also catchy to keep people focused on what it is that we're trying to do. So in BCR, we also have what we call the three Ps. That's program, practice, and policy. And that's our end goal. How are we changing program? How are we changing practice? And ultimately, for long-term change and for systems change and sustainability, how are we informing and influencing policy? So I put these two maps up here to show you the comparison of where BCR official communities are versus where we have policy influence. So part of the work is not only working very deeply in communities, that you're doing things that are very specific to your partners in the, in the community that you work with, but also how we zoom out and think about how do we take what you've learned, your successes, or identify barriers, systematic barriers, and inform federal policy so that we are thinking about the longer term, the big term change. And so we have a number of different network partners from across the country, and this year, in fact, just last week, last Monday, yeah, last Monday, we had our second annual Hill Day. And so we brought partners from all these different states here to meet with their federal lawmakers, both in the Senate and the House. And yes, I was with dearest Ted Cruz, Senator Ted Cruz last week. 
but it's enticing. <laughs> but we work with everyone. We don't choose our friends. Um, and, and that's part of the beauty of BCR is that we've always put kids at the center of this. And so when you, when you position child welfare, it's easier to bring people to the table. And, and so we've always kept what is really the heart of BCR is really about how are we building more resilient communities for, as you see in all of our written materials, for children and families. That's a nonpartisan issue. Now, the interpretation of that might be influenced by an individual's politics. But ultimately, what we're looking at are those levers of change that will impact how we are developing healthy, robust children in our communities. And so that has been where it was interesting in Senator Cruz's office to hear who is a deserving child and who's not. But that wasn't the purpose of my visit. The purpose of my visit is when this federal vehicle is passed, it's up to the person at the state level to apply their values and their principles to this opportunity. I need the lever to be opened. And so I will work across both sides of the aisle to make sure that the lever is available for all of our communities. So that's you know, some of the nuancing and some of the training that we work with our teams is that you can't say that you're not gonna work with someone because of so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. If they're in a position of power, we need to be heard, we need to be seen, and we need to continue to advocate. So that's part of the work of BCR. So Ed's gonna play a video here that shows us how our teams work across the country in this. This is like one of those cable commercials. Do we need to hit reload on it?
a little hook up there. So while we're getting back to the Prezi, um, a couple of things that you saw there is that, um, number one, there's the community engagement piece and how our teams are working really innovatively um, in community. So the community ambassador program was something that this team from Missouri has done with their alive and well communities. So I, I talk about, you know, we have our PhDs that work in all of our systems and agencies, but we also have the wisdom, what I call the, the cadre of PhD mamas in our neighborhood. So I, I spoke this morning about Mama Love, and um, I call her a PhD because she certainly has wisdom of the community um, that we should be mining and certainly respecting um, that data that she can bring to the table. So that's part of the, the ambassador program that they use in St. Louis is, how are we using these ambassadors as really sort of this extension of this resilience movement to reduce one of the issues that they have is like reducing stigma around accessing mental health care. If you need it, use it. Um, and then also, how are we using ambassadors to really help to shape the narrative of the community and our understanding of what adversity looks like in the community? So that's you know one of the ways that BCR has kind of expressed itself. You you saw a video in the video there with the community convening adjoining forces for children in Cincinnati, where they wanted to have a multidiscipline, multi-ethnic, multi-racial racial, um, gathering of community individuals to really understand just ACEs. Like what is it when we talk about childhood adversity? And one one of the um, town halls that we did with them when we first started doing the work, uh, at the time, Vice Mayor Mann, who Cincinnati's where I grew up, and so it's one of those towns where people never leave. Um, I just saw a wormhole and I snuck out. Um, but my, Vice Mayor Mann was the mayor when I was in high school a few decades ago. Um, and he is still in city government. And when we did the presentation on ACEs, he said, why hasn't anyone ever told me about this? We talk about poverty, and that's just like, I don't know how I'm gonna solve poverty, but I get this ACEs thing. Because I've got ACEs myself, but no one ever told me that that's what it is. And so just helping you know, educate and create this common understanding was extremely powerful with city council leaders, with the mayor's office, um, with business leaders, because then they begin to understand, well, if we're talking about preventing ACEs, now I understand what this resilience business is all about and what the importance of the resilience and the, the supports and buffers are about. And so it's so important to not only be able to define ACEs, but also think about, again, we're trying to do this from a strength-based position. Not a def this is not a deficit model. This is what can we build upon in light of the deficits that we see, and through the collaborations, we can begin to fill some of those deficits so that we are putting those supports in place. So having this common understanding about resilience just what are those factors? What is the science? What does the evidence show us that individuals need to be resilient? That's all there. This isn't, this isn't something that's secret that's hidden in a box. It's already there. And a lot of folks who work in social work might be familiar with some of these factors here because I think it's like social work 101. Um, <laughs> so if, you're, if, you're, if you are in social work, I, forgive me, but not everyone in the room understands that. And so it's important to be able to share this knowledge that we all are at the same grounding here. But what I put this, uh, this slide up for is not necessarily to teach you anything. It's more to spark a larger understanding about what is the community role, what are the systems role in being able to support these things for individuals and families. Because again, as you heard me earlier say, it's not enough to treat individuals, band-aid them, and throw them right back into a vicious environment. We have to really think back to what's driving, what's in our soil. So that was when I started doing the research that, that led to the BCR process, is understanding, well, what do we know about resilient communities? Like, what are the factors? We've got all these factors that we know about individual and family level resilience, but what do we know about a resilient, like how will I measure it? How will I know it when I see it? And um, you have to go outside of social work and psychology and psychiatry to find that. And actually what I ended up finding it is in um, disaster preparedness, emergency response, a lot of papers written by FEMA, by Homeland Security, um, by the CDC, and a lot of money that was put into research following 9-11, following Hurricane Katrina, like 
How could we predict how well a community would bounce back after suffering disaster, whether that's man-made or natural? And so there was these four components that a lot of these studies kept coalescing around. It's, you know, how well is information and communication shared, um, both within a community, but also from community agencies down to, I mean, from systems down to community agencies. And then the community competence is not how competent are individuals, but how can individuals access those things that lead to competence, you know, whether that is, you have to evacuate in 24 hours. Can you get your stuff together, know what to get together, and know how to get to from point A to point B? Where Do you know where the evacuation centers are? So similarly, if we provide, you know, kind of look at these things through a prevention lens, I would think, okay, my family is enduring stress here. Can I access my council member? Can I access you know, my neighborhood commissioner, however it looks, um, to really get those needs addressed? And will I be received as someone who is competent, that is able to advocate and has the social co capital to really leverage that system? And so that was, you know, when you look at that competence in the social capital piece, it's like social capital is not just something that people leverage between each other. It's really thinking about how community can leverage influence with its systems. And so that's also, when, when you look at how well a community can bounce back, it's like certain sides of the river get more attention from emergency preparedness than others. Some people are invisible, even if they're on the roof, waving a white flag with a helicopter going over and screaming for help. And that was the vision from Katrina. Some people were left to float downriver, and others were rescued. So that's a social capital issue that we have to address when we think about community resilience. But one of the things that, particularly from public health, that we don't always talk about, but again, it's like that ob duh, obvious thing is economic development. So through all of this disaster preparedness literature, you see constantly the role of economic development. Did people have something to come back to? So again, when we talk about the bounce back versus bounce forward, we want people to bounce back. Do they have something to bounce off of? So that's the role of community of economic development that we also weave into the BCR work, is that it's not enough to think about service providers. We have to think about the larger ecosystem, the economic vitality of the communities. You know, do individuals have access to livable wages, jobs that are actually providing sustenance for their families and stabilities for, for the community. So that's our framing for resilience. I think I just walked through you know, how you break that down and look at that through the, um, through the BCR lens and certainly through the app. You can look at those um, specific pockets to think about you know, how you might build social capital or what, how you might measure social capital um, in your community or how you might measure economic development or thinking about to what end do you want to leverage economic development in your resilience movement. So back to the tree. So through thinking about this from a more prevention standpoint, the pair of ACEs isn't about merely identifying adversity using a checklist to see, you know, is there maternal depression, is, is there abuse and neglect, but it's really to gauge the health, wealth, and well-being of your community writ large. And so thinking about using the tree metaphor, if you think about the pair of aces tree, any of us walking down the street can pretty much quickly judge the health of a tree. Looking at the vibrancy of the green leaves on the tree or the strength, are the branches healthy, strong? Would I let my kid climb up this tree because it looks like the branches could actually support the tree? But what we don't necessarily see easily is that soil that's feeding that tree. So thinking about what's feeding a healthy tree or a withering tree or what is in the soil of a dead tree. And so applying that through the lens of BCR, it helps you put in context these things that we see that happen to individuals and families into this larger context of the community environment. But when you put it into the community environment, it also forces you to go beyond individual actors and really think about the system's role. 
So this is really to help you begin to understand the interconnectedness and really communicate the interconnectedness of what's happening beneath the soil with policy and practice that is driving some of the outcomes that you see. So that's why you heard me say here this morning that I've thrown out using social determinants of health. We don't use those in the work because social determinants really frames it only through looking at it at the individual. And then that immediately you're driving towards individual solutions without taking into consideration the larger context. So what we use in BCR is instead of talking about social determinants of anything, talk about systems-driven community characteristics. Because that puts the shared responsibility on individuals, but also back on systems. And that systems have very much an active role in solving these issues. So in building community resilience, if you come to the grantee meeting tomorrow, we have actually prepared some of these um, data sheets that we use in our work. So one of the um, important central operating principles of BCR is there's no data without stories and no stories without data. And one of, what, what you'll learn in the policy realm is that staffers love data. These are really smart people usually that work in the staff level. They love data, but the lawmakers love the stories because they're the ones that are out there talking and they want to tell a story. But the one by themselves is not enough. And so putting that community narrative, remember I said shared um, uh, understanding is at the top of the of the wheel for BCR and that's for a good reason. The qualitative data is so important to understanding the numbers that we see, the data that, that we see on these charts. But these, these data sheets that we prepare helps communities and their coalition building efforts really begin to think about what's the problem that we're trying to solve. So what does the tree look like in my community? And it helps you compare yourself, not only nationally or statewide, but also to neighboring counties, because everybody likes a little bit of healthy competition. So when you look at that and you see that, you know, Austin is being compared to Texas, to Travis County, and to Harris County, and you say, well, we can do better than Harris. We can certainly be the state. I mean, a little bit of healthy competition goes a long way. Um, but it also helps to zone in on what are some of those weaknesses that we can shore up, and is there an opportunity to learn from a neighboring county? Is there an opportunity to learn at what the state's doing versus what we might be doing here? So it's coalition building, but it's also education, and it's a way to benchmark yourself with the work. So tomorrow I'll share with you um, a little bit of, we'll do, do a deeper dive, and so you can look at the Paravasis data that we've pulled um, for each one of your counties. But what I want to do right now is give you an opportunity to actually begin to ask yourself the question about your parabasis. So what does adversity look like in your community, the community that you serve? So what are on the leaves and the branches there? And then what's in your soil? So you don't necessarily have to use the same words that we have here. Um, it could be something completely different. Because remember, what we're using there at the top, and I think it's important um, for you to think about this, is what the ACEs, the 10 classic ACEs that you see listed all the time in the ACEs questionnaire, that was derived from a study that was done at Kaiser Permanente's obesity clinic uh, in Northern California, all white women. So let's just think about that. So all white women, upper middle class, access to really good insurance, going to an obesity clinic. I don't know if that represents the population that you serve, but that's where we got the definition of ACEs. It doesn't discount that, but it also isn't inclusive of what might be the experience in your community. So I want you to think about what does the experience, what, is the, what does it look like? What does adversity look like in your community? If you were to look at branches and trees in your community. So it might be completely different. And then also with regard to adverse community environments, this was just to get you started to think about those systems drivers that might be contributing to overall adversity in your community. So I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes. Please collaborate, share, collaborate, collaborate, and then we'll come back. Anyone wanna volunteer? Okay, oh, that means I heard laughs. That means you wanna volunteer. Oh, I was <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs>
Am I just talking about the tree and yeah. the soil? So, yeah. Well, we, <laughs> we talked about, I really was not intending to talk. Um, we talked about how this will look different for each of us depending on our communities, but also how we interact with our communities. So we might not even know everything that's going on um, in our community mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. we don't experience it ourselves. Um, we talked about some things like, um, is there actually a lack of opportunity or is it people not seeing the opportunity, not taking hold of it? Um, that could differ depending on people's viewpoints and experiences. Um, talked about cease substance abuse and how that can be both soil and leaves. Um, education, neighborhood safety, um, homelessness, and also um, homelessness that is not always counted as homelessness, so people moving a lot, um, and um, how that creates poor soil as well. So much driving. Which driving the yeah, moving so around? Yeah. Well, in the specific <laughs> instance, I believe it was things like Hurricane Harvey mm -hmm. um, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, what you talked about, actually, you know, it's interesting because what you're talking about is a mix of chronic and acute shocks. So you've got the you had the acute shock, which was Hurricane Harvey, but I would imagine that. The homelessness issue was always there. It was a chronic issue, and so the, when the hurricane came in, it just kind of laid bare what was, you know, something that was easily ignored. Now, not so easily ignored. So, how? Wh what would you think with regard to the other systems? If you were trying to build a coalition around this, who else would you bring to the table? Housing Authority. What's that? The housing authority. Absolutely. And what about what about um, economic development? Because it can't just be public dollars. I mean, that's a very finite pie. Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce. Absolutely, Chamber of Commerce. But in the Chamber of Commerce is not only to drive housing, but it's also to make sure that individuals. Why are they homeless? They don't have jobs, right? And so we're also thinking about job creation. So with all of that, you know, obviously there's still going to be the need for some of the more social and human services with regard to trauma-informed care, but you can clearly see the, trauma, the provision of trauma-informed care or access to mental health is no good if we're not addressing some of the larger systemic issues. So who else wants to talk? Okay, I know it's late in the afternoon. Well. I, oh, I, yeah. You know, if you give me a back 20 minutes, I'll take 30 minutes. Okay, well, okay. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Let me take a well, chair. We come, we come from the, we're looking at this tree and from our community, from my perspective and other people in our, from our community, and we have three of us here that are from the same community. The, the tree for us, I mean, there's, there's a lot of factors in our community, such as poverty. And that, that's one of the biggest things, because we have a high rate of poverty. Uh, the lack of opportunity and, and economic mobility. Uh, community disruption. Um, we come from a we, we have a university in our community, so that they're developing relationships in the community, and that's a good thing because I think it's been a long time coming. We do have violence, but it's kind of somewhat our 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 community is like it. It's de there's a delineation between North Street and South Street. So all the good is at North Street, and all the bad is at South Street. It's a very diverse community, but it's very segregated. <coughs> There's still a lot of discrimination. And so our education system is starting to improve. Our economic development is starting to improve because they're starting to try to make it so that people can work. If you, if you work in, in that country, you can only work with a university, with a school district, or with uh, uh, Pilgrim's Pride. So there's not a whole lot of, of jobs. Now with 69 coming, they're talking about they're going to develop a lot of, hopefully more jobs and stuff. But our community, it, we have a lot of people that have been there for a long time. There's a lot of history in Nacogdoches. There's a lot of people that have been there for all their lives. And they've struggled uh, to slavery through, through all the bad times. And there's still a lot of that fear of coming out. Now we have a big Hispanic population that has really come into our community that's been there since I, I've been there 20 years and it's increased for numbers of years. We have a high percentage of Hispanic children in our school system and we don't service them the way we should, I don't think. I'm on the school board, I've been on the school board for two years, and so as a social worker, I'm really trying to make sure that we're gonna be offering 
every child in our community, I don't care what color they are, the opportunity to be successful with their education. And we, we owe them that. We owe them that. And if we don't do that, then we're doing a disservice to our families and our community. So that's just some of the things. I don't know if somebody else wants to say something about this. Our soil needs to be improved. It's improving. Our it trees are getting green. Our tree is getting green. Our leaves are getting greener. Our mental illness, mental health issue, I think, is across the border all over the state. We have to have better services for people who have mental health problems. We do have a coalition there that works with the police department and the sheriff's department. Uh, but we have a long ways to go. We have a long ways to go. And uh, uh, this, what we're doing now, we need to include more people from the community. We have several different entities that come to the cafe conversations and what we're trying to build this coalition. But we need more people that have power to come and hear the real story instead of sending somebody out to be able to start. <coughs> That's what I do. So I want to pick up on a couple things that you said there. Number one, um, as I said earlier, what we try to do is start with a strength-based approach. And so something you said was really important. Our, our leaves are getting greener, our branches are getting stronger. Can you share with others, like, how are you actually creating the nutrients in the soil that are, are okay. showing those outcomes? Well, I can, I can speak from the perspective of being on the school board because two years ago when I took office, our school board was hated. Our school district was hated by the community. There was no trust. There was no faith in them. Um, and we have gotten an interim superintendent who was born and raised in our community who has strong connections. He's on the Board of Regents for SFA. He knows everybody in town. He's a, he's a great leader. Uh, he has pulled that board together and we work as a team. We're focusing on what's best for the community. He has gotten, uh, uh, what do you call it, our, all the businesses in town are supporting us. Um, uh, the, what was the name of that organization in the community that we, we talked about earlier? Uh, Which one? No, the other, the, no, the, uh, the one, the, I'm old, okay? Um, it's been a long day, I haven't slept much last night. But anyway, oh, we, he's tied in to the community and we're working as a team. And so we have gotten more respect for the school board. Uh, we've, got, we've gotten, uh, they're trying to find ways to be all inclusive of other groups because we don't have that inclusiveness. But I think there's an effort to really pull our community together. But we need people that are empowered to be in that group that can make some decisions um, because we do have some resistance and there will be that resistance. But I think, I, I love working with people I'm working with in this coalition because there are people with good hearts, and they want what's best for people in the community. But, um, and I think we also need to include more, more younger people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, very much. Nice. We, a good thing we have some people running for office in our community now that are young people. That it's a good thing. I think it's a great thing. So, um, I, I think we're, we're getting slowly. We're going to get there, and I think we're going to change our community in a lot of different ways. And if we can come through with this to, to provide better health service, mental health services in our community. We have a Burke Center, which is fantastic, but people don't have insurance. You know, all the kinds of issues that people that don't have money, uh, don't have connections, uh, it's very difficult to get assistance. Thank you. So it sounds like you have the winning combination there, because you are working with a number of different sectors. You've got economic development at the table. You've got important champions within the education system. And one of the things I think that is really important that you talked about, and we didn't talk about yet, is this, uh, this idea of not just community empowerment, but political empowerment. So this has actually happened in our uh, community, in Alive and Well communities in St. Louis where they have been working with their ambassadors and one of the ambassadors decided to run for city council and won. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, there was a little bit of blowback for a lot of well communities because the council member that was unseated had been a big proponent of and supporter of a lot of well communities. And, and, and when I got the call, I just said, well, tell them that they were really successful. This is progress. So, um, I, you know, I think that that's an important narrative about how do we take a community that has been disenfranchised and really provide not only the community empowerment, but the political empowerment and you know, putting them at, helping them to see that they have a role in the po um, political system and policy and advocacy piece. So um, I wanna get, I wanna make sure, unless someone's really dying to share their example, I do wanna get to some of the examples specifically from the communities of BCR. Um, what, again, this is 
as you've probably understood through the conversations now, when you're applying the four um, components of BCR, when we're creating the shared understanding, we're talking about you know structural inequities. What are the adversities that um, that arise from these structural uh, inequities? When we're talking about assessing the state of readiness, that is being very deliberate and looking at what are the policy and program gaps, but also understanding that there's implicit bias in practice, in program, and how are we addressing that across of our, our various partners. Bringing, as you said, I love the idea, you already have economic development at the table, that's so important, but how do we leverage those champions to make sure that we have equitable access across the various systems and sectors, and then what is the policy and practice change that we are all driving towards? Again, remembering that with community at the table, we are, I quote, there's the prioritization of the issues and the co-creation of solutions. So how has that been applied in the BCR communities? So I want to share with you an example from Washington, D.C., um, where we were working with a group of physicians that at our federally qualified health center, community um, health care. And so the physicians there were very interested in thinking about, well, how can we begin to address the social determinants? And we're thinking, you know, based on our data, we understand that we have a high prevalence of heart disease amongst our patient population. We also have a high prevalence of diabetes. And you know, we're, we're, we have a feeling that there's probably a lot of mental illness, although our patient population doesn't really talk to us about that. Um, but maybe if we did a, a support group for moms, or maybe if we did yoga for new moms, and that would be more of a social thing, but it could also teach them mindfulness, that might improve some of the outcomes that we see with, our, with the kids. And mind you that um, Unity Healthcare is in Ward 7, Ward 8, which is east of the Anacostia in Washington, D.C. Many of you are old enough to remember when AAA used to do triptychs. And so if you ever got a triptych for Washington, D.C. in the 70s or the 80s, literally Ward 7 and Ward 8 were unmapped. They weren't even put on the map. So you were, if you were coming in as a tourist, you thought that Washington, D.C. ended at the Anacostia River. Um, and so it is, it has, it's a community that has been left off the map um, in many respects, uh, largely or predominantly African-American. Um, this is the community where, I think I said earlier, you have 50,000 residents for, for one, one grocery store for 50,000 residents. Whereas in other parts of the ward, you have, I mean, other parts of the city, you have nine, 10 grocery stores. I mean, you can trip over a grocery store in other parts of the city. And that's okay. Everybody thought that was okay. I mean, what do they need grocery stores for in Ward 7 and Ward 8? Um, in fact, the, the, the only full service hospital um, closed. There's no access to uh, obstetric care. So moms that want to deliver have to make their way across the Anacostia to deliver. So we can imagine what's happening with infant mortality and infant, um, you know, perinatal outcomes. So when we were interviewing the physicians there and they were trying to think about how do we begin to go upstream and address some of these things that are happening in community, how would we, you know, provide some programming here at the hospital? And you know their idea was the let's do a food market. Let's bring in a farmers market here at the at the uh, at the hospital. We can do a part of we can block off a part of the parking lot to do that. We can do the support group. Blah blah blah. And I said okay, these are all great and valid ideas given that you're focused on the clinical outcomes. But perhaps we should talk to residents, your patients who live here in this community, and find out what they might need. And simply just ask the question, what is your greatest barrier to achieving optimal health and well-being? Very open-ended question. We don't need a survey questionnaire that has 50 different questions. Just ask that one question and see what arises. So we did a series of interviews, got a nice little spot inside the lobby area, and um, people were more than happy to talk to me. And out of that, um, focus groups and um, key informant interviews. The number one stressor that was um, cited was interactions with Metropolitan Police mm. and the stress that that causes in community. Mm. Stress for parents worrying about their children, stress in adults, and just you know, are they sizing me up as a as a criminal? I you know I feel like I can't I can't do 
anything in the community without, you know, the 5-0 on me. And so clearly seeing that it was a major stressor for the residents there. And I, you know, it went from having to worry about their child being arrested for fare evasion when simply the child could not, their, their Metro card, um, you know, how kids are, they're not gonna track how much money's on their Metro card, so they tapped and there was not enough money for them to get out. And well, what's 12 year old to do? I gotta get out of the Metro station. And once they tried to so-called evade the fare, they had cuffs slapped on them, the 12 year old. <laughs> um, so there was that, there was, you know, um, the response from police with regard to community violence. In fact, one woman that I interviewed, it was on the anniversary of her son's death, who had been shot and killed on the street um, in the community. And she, the way that she found out is that someone was, it was the two blocks over from her house, she heard that there was a shooting, she knew that her son was out. So any mother would, you know, immediately go there and she went to the scene and she recognized his shoes that were poking out from underneath the sheet. That's how she was notified of her son's death. But what's even more horrifying is any mother that comes across that is going to be hysterical. It is your worst day as a mother. So she reacted very emotionally. Police were pushing her, get back from the scene, get back, calm down, calm down lady. And she's selling them, that's my son, that's my son. And they slapped cuffs on her and threw her in the back of the squad car mm -hmm. because she was being belligerent and not paying attention to what the officer was saying. A year later, as I'm talking to her, she's clearly still visible. There was nothing from the Office of Victims of Crime to offer her any supports as far as trauma is concerned, mm -hmm. nor anybody else who had witnessed what had happened. So you've got this vicarious trauma that's going on in the, in the, in the community and people witnessing and feeling empathy for the mom and seeing her treatment by police officers. And so, you know, there's this historical native narrative that is fed in that. And so she also then proceeded to tell me about the fact that every time that she would call to find out if has anyone been able to arrest who everyone else in the community is pointing fingers at and common talk, and the police say, oh yeah, we're on it, but there's nothing being done on her son's investigation. And so that was just one snippet of understanding the interactions with MPD, Metropolitan Police, and the stressors. But then the other stressor that came out of the key informant interviews was something I didn't see coming. And that was that every woman that we spoke to shared her history of sexual violence whether that was sexual trauma that was suffered at the hands of an intimate partner, a family member, or someone just on the street. And I thought to myself, and this was before me too, so we did these key informant interviews about two years ago in the summer, and, and I thought to myself, this isn't even on the radar of any of these clinicians, and I don't even know how much of this is in the case files. Are we even having these conversations with our patients? When we think about what's contributing to heart disease, when we think about what's contributing to the fact that it's not just that you can't get to, a, you don't have a grocery store, you're afraid to go because of what's happening in your community environment. So we went back to um, Unity Healthcare and we said, you know, we applaud your interest in wanting to address some of these other issues that are very proximal to the health outcomes. But if we're not thinking about what's also in the ecosystem here in this community. Only what you, what you deliver here in a clinical environment is gonna have very nil effect on your patients. And through that dialogue, it comes out that Unity Healthcare, the physicians there, are actually physicians in DC jails. They're the number one health provider in DC jails. So they're seeing a lot of their patients, not only in community, but they're also seeing them when they're incarcerated. They're also seeing the police officers that are bringing, sometimes, the patients to them. And they have a rapport with these police officers. They're trusted by community, clearly, because community members are telling me some very painful and personal stories, only because their physician said, you should talk to her. And they're also trusted by law enforcement. They are a neutral convener. They can be a broker for a dialogue. 
And so we proposed to them and said, you know, hey, great, you know, it's great that you want to do these other things, but I think we have a larger opportunity here to make a difference in the community. So we, were, we launched what was what's called the Root Causes Dialogue, and that is bringing police officers and youth together to talk about the tensions and community, to really provide an opportunity for us to understand the law enforcement perspective, dig, dig deeper into what has been captured on video about some really, I mean, if you Google Ward 7, um, Ward 8, police, um, community policing on YouTube, there are some very disturbing um, videos that have been, that have been captured of police interactions in community. And the fact there was a full-blown council, city council hearing about that where the chief was brought to bear to defend police activity there. And there really is no defense when you see some of the videos. But at the same time, you have to understand that <laughs> it's easy to say that it's racist, but there's also something that's about the culture of law enforcement that many of us don't understand. So I'm not going to jump to a preconceived notion until I actually have an opportunity to have a conversation. And similarly, we've asked the police officers, don't jump to a notion about a child because of their zip code and because of the way, the swagger that they might have without having a conversation. Can we simply have a conversation? And so that's the project that we have been working on. And we actually did a town hall last week where we had police officers and we had the Department of Youth um, and Re Rehabilitative Services. So this is a juvenile justice um, wing of this, the Attorney General, who in, in DC we operate as both a city and a state. And so having the Attorney General's office at the table means that they're the ones that actually adjudicate juveniles and they also adjudicate adults. So they um, are able to work across generations but also across different communities. And they have, because they've been a part of this dialogue, have really started thinking about, well, how can we do more restorative justice as opposed to immediately move into incarceration? And how can police begin to see that maybe there's a different way of policing in community? And, and, and also, perhaps, there's an opportunity to educate our youth about what is a proper interaction with police officers. Respect can be given on both sides. And so that's you know leveraging this opportunity for community dialogue, bringing multiple sectors together to really identify what are the issues and how do we come together for solutions. So what is the goal? The goal was really derived by both police input as well as youth input as well as other community stakeholders. And that was how can we connect youth and police that's outside of a law enforcement type engagement, um, something that's going to be much more promotion. Like I remember one in one interview, uh, a parent was talking about, I remember when the police used to just come out of their cars and play basketball with us. And they don't do that anymore. And then one kid said, yeah, no, they just stand there on the corner and watch us fight because they think we're animals. And I didn't say anything, and I said, well, but if you're fighting, how would anyone perceive you as anything but? So really putting in a grain of, a grain of thought for both sides to understand the perceptions and what drives those perceptions, but how do we get to a healthier way of coexisting? So um, what the police officers actually said were, you know what we'd really like? We'd like to work with these kids. Wouldn't it be great if we could have a community youth advisory board? Because we don't understand half the stuff that's coming out of the streets. We don't understand, you know, we hear slang and we immediately think to, okay, so what are they up to? And the slang might be simply, I'm going to get a lollipop. I mean, who knows? But I'm just saying, because if you don't understand what someone is saying, and you already have this preconceived notion, and you've got this history and this training that's behind it, it's easy to go down one path as opposed to another. And so they want to actually create this youth advisory board. Of course, in community right now, there's a lot of mistrust. So we've got to build that bridge. We've got a lot of work to do to get to these goals. But at least we've started. We've started a conversation. And with this, what we found is that there are a lot of other communities who are like, well, how are you doing this? And we can do this too, because this isn't something that is just, you know, unique to DC. This issue with community policing and communities of color, that tension is persistent across and consistent across our country. 
And so I think that, you know, looking at how we can create, through simple dialogue, we can get to innovation, working across these partners. This is one of those really um, great examples that I'm very proud of what has come with the partners. But another example of cross-sector collaboration that we've been doing um, has, been, has come out of the Portland work. And so that is um, working with the Fabian School, which is a Portland public school there. And so Fabian School is from the largest catchment area in Portland public schools that also has the highest concentration of poverty. So if you really stop and pause about that for a moment, Brown versus Board of Education passed 60 years ago. Almost 60 years ago, I think it was last month, and or this month. And, and that was to, on the face of it, outlaw segregation in our schools. And we all know that we have extremely segregated schools in the United States, both economically as well as racially. And so when I heard the story about Fabian, Fabian being the largest catchment area in Portland Public Schools, with the highest concentration of poverty and largely communities of color. Now, I don't know how many of you know about Portland, Oregon, but Portland, Oregon is um, about 2% African American, so you really have to go out of your way to like draw a district that catches all of the people of color and the most highly concentrated, but it tells you how we draw our systems. It's not just about people of light wanting to be around each other. It's how we, our systems drive these areas of concentration. And so that has been part of the conversation in Portland, but that's a whole other part of it. Um, but part of it came out of this collaboration when, it, you know, when we sat in these rooms and we were like, well, why is it that this is the makeup, the economic and racial makeup of this school? And why is it okay that these kids are in a decrepit, decaying building, um, as opposed to some of the capital improvements that have been put in other schools across the district. So what happened at Fabian School was the principal decided to go right next door to Concordia University, which is a Lutheran university who's been there, I think, 100, and, 100 plus years. And they like to tell themselves that we are the community. We've been here longer than anyone. And yet, in the shadow of Concordia University is Fabian School that when the principal went next door, the president of the university said, you know, I've never even been in your school. You're the first principal that invited me. Well, if you've been there for 120 years, shouldn't you have brought a welcome basket? <laughs> I mean, that's a good neighbor, right? So, so she went there not because she was so interested in Fabian School, but she was desperate because she saw that these kids are coming in, they're traumatized, they have all kinds of needs that you know, her teachers can't address. And she simply wanted an art teacher. And she knew that they had an art education program at, at Concordia University. So she was going to the university president and just saying, do you think you might be able to loan some of your art students to my school so that I can at least offer some art education? I think it would be a great release for our kids. God knows they need it. And so he said, well, I'm gonna come over. I'm gonna see what the school's all about. So he comes over out of the ivory tower, tower and he's like, wait a minute. Right, is this a school or are we housing animals? I know barns that are in better shape than this. Literally tiles falling from the building, mold in the walls. And if you know anything about Port Portland Public Schools, Two years ago, they had to cut off all of their water fountains because of the lead contaminant in, um, in the pipes there. And so, you know, they're shipping in water. All the kids have to use water bottles now um, to drink water, to have water between classes and such because they can't use the water there. But there were capital improvements that were going on in other schools to address this, but not necessarily Fabia. So he said, well, not only can I provide art students, but um, you know, do your teachers need aids? Um, and we also have a nursing school, we have a school of social work, and I would love for my students to be able to come in here and get some practical experience in working with their future population. And so he created a CE program, I mean a, a practicum program for his nursing students, his social work students, his art ed students, to actually come in and provide adjunct services to the school, but the students are getting credit, and the students at the school are getting the much needed services and support that they need. 
That's not is the work is. of public schools, but the yes. private yes. university did the work. So as he became to get, as his, as his students began to get more involved in the school, his students were outraged and said, you know, this is not good enough. We need to actually put a little bit more fire to the heat, um, to the feet of Portland Public Schools because this should not stand. So the president went back to the board, the regents, board of regents at the university, and he said, you know, we, we sit on a really big fat endowment, and we're right next to a school that needs help. So they pledged $15 million to rebuild the school. But it wasn't enough for them, because $15 million is not going to rebuild an entire school. But it's enough to shame someone else in the political arena. So they, they, they took their $15 million and went back, to sit, went back to Portland Public Schools and said, look, this is what we're doing. This is the skin that we're willing to put into this game. What are you willing to do to make this right for these kids, for these families? And so years had gone where they had been, had been advocating for a bond measure to improve the schools, and the Portland Public Schools said, oh, there's just not the political appetite to do this, we can't push for this, blah, blah, blah. Suddenly now that Concordia University is saying, is putting, not only putting up the money, but also saying, what are you gonna do? They found the will, the political will, to put up $30 million for the school. And so, two years ago, we cut the ribbon on the Fabian School, the new three, to, and it's called three to PhD, because when Concordia acquired the architect to build it, they said, we want our students to learn side by side with your students. So there are actually college university classrooms inside this elementary school, and it's three to PhD because they also instituted wow. a preschool program that there. So the idea is that those kids are going to school and they're going shoulder to shoulder with college students. And you've got kids coming to elementary school saying, when am I going to college too? So it's building the seeds that are necessary for today, but also building the hope and the aspirations for tomorrow. Now, everybody wants to be a part of a winning story. So this isn't a story that ended with Concordia University and Portland Public Schools making a dream come true. They also, along the way, just um, through working with the community, with the, the parents, understanding what do the parents need in addition to what we could provide within these walls. What do you need as a community to create a more stable environment for your kids? The parents said, it would be great if you could just give us a living room because we don't have a place in our community where we can just meet and relax and talk and connect. So they have a fireside room that they created within the school. So when parents drop off their kids, they can actually stay and connect with one another. Knowing that access to computers and resource and, and internet is a struggle for these parents, and that's the way that you submit job applications these days, or you get housing, get in the queue for housing, they also created a computer resource room so that parents can access the internet, so they can, you know, begin to access, you know, economic mobility. They can get, you know, access safer uh, housing. Then they also realize, you know, the kids are hungry, and they don't have access to um, nutritious foods. So they work with Basics, is the organic food supplier, actually supplies a Whole Foods in the in that region. And they said, well, we'll set up a food store. Mm. We'll sell it at cost. And we'll work with the state so that we can accept SNAP benefits, we can accept credit card payments, we can accept cash. We've normalized accessing, you know, access to fresh foods because that's what they need, and we can do that. Kaiser Permanente said we'll leverage some of our community benefit dollars and put a health and wellness center in the school, and it's dual facing. So what you have is you have the kids can access not only behavioral health and, um, well, and, and health care, they can also access oral care right there. Um, and there's a community facing side of this so that adults in the community can access health care as well. So it's totally Medicaid, um, a total Medicaid provider. Through that process, they also partnered with another behavioral health care specialist that provided trauma-informed training for their, for, their, um, for their teachers because we know that many that are on the front line are wounded warriors themselves. And so just being able to tap into that wellness for themselves so that they can pass on some of that healing to the children that they serve was really important. So again, this didn't happen overnight. 
This was seven years and a lot of lawyers involved because a lot of agreements, but they made it happen because they stayed at the table. And as they began to understand, we need this and we need that. Well, we don't have that at the table. Let's bring in a food supplier. We need healthcare, behavioral health. Well, let's bring in a, a behavioral health specialist. Let's bring the folks at the table that can serve the specific needs of our community. What, again, back to the central question that I gave you at the beginning. What is the problem that we're trying to solve and who needs to be at the table? Because at the end of the day, the Fabian story is a fabulous story. When you see that it was the only school in the whole Portland Public School District, elementary school, that increased attendance, increased reading levels, increased teacher retention, and also decreased behavioral issues that are going on in the, in the, within that school. And that's because everything that they need is right there. They answer the needs. But that, to me, is one, another great example of the power of collaboration. So that story, the DC story, the Portland story, and stories from our other communities on how they are leveraging the power of collaboration through using the uh, BCR format, the process, and all the tools and resources is on our website. All of that is free, and we don't charge for any of that. And I invite you to use what is important to you, but more importantly to remember that we don't get to resilient community until we address the traumas and the inequities that are driving them. So thank you.